Hi everybody, I'm Bill Whittle here with Steve Green and Scott Ott, and this is the Right Angle Show. You know, normally guys, our, the, the mantra in the space program is, help us, Elon Musk Kenobi, you're our only hope. <laughs> However, there are some breakthroughs happening in other areas, and I thought I'd bring up one of these because I have a personal interest in it, and it's something I know a little bit about, something's kind of interesting. So, imagine my joy and surprise when I read the following headline. NASA planning suspended animation cryosleep chamber that lets astronauts hibernate whilst traveling to different worlds. Well, the first thing I like about that headline is you get to do it whilst traveling to different <laughs> worlds. Uh, presumably you'll be taking a buggy of some kind, perhaps a truck, uh, so, something that will get you there whilst you're enjoying, you know, punch and, uh, and whilst you're uh, thinking about the King's English. Uh, but there's some actually some good news here. There's a company that is being funded by NASA to the tune of $500,000 to study the, the actual effects of what used to be known as suspended animation, but in the real world really consists of a form of basically a medical coma, medically induced coma that they keep you in. Now the advantages to this are obviously pretty strong. If you can have the crew sleeping during a lot of the time, then they don't have to be eating or breathing as much or any of this stuff. So uh, Steve, let's start with you. You've certainly had your, uh, your, your, your pulse rate slowed to near death levels probably <laughs> more times than, than anybody can, can ever account. You know, when you go on a long flight from, let's say, Los Angeles to New York, there's nothing better than going to sleep right as you take off and waking up on the other end. What do you think about this idea of putting these guys in sleep on the way out to Mars or wherever the hell we happen to be going? Well, I'm really sensitive to this issue, believe it or not, because I'm one of these these weird people. I can't sleep in vehicles. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a plane, a bus, a train. I can't go to sleep. I've never been able to, not even when I was a a kid and so anything that could help me deal with this i'd be in favor of and i'm also in favor of uh, any kind of space program that gets sigourney weaver in a cold room in her underwear <laughs> i think we can all agree that that is a uh, a huge plus for uh, for all of mankind. And I, I a, can't a, agree. I've, I've never gotten the Sigourney kind. Weaver thing. No, boy, I'm going to rewatch Alien this afternoon. Just okay, just for that. But uh, you know what I flashed on is uh, Stranger in a Strange Land, where Robert Heinlein goes into a lot of detail in the first part of the book, explaining how to pick a crew for a uh, for a two year mission to Mars, and he didn't use suspended animation, as uh, you were saying at our conference call yesterday. No magic, pure hard science mm -hmm. fiction. And no magic, right? Yeah, since he couldn't come up with a way to uh, get people to sleep for two years, he's he, he came up with a uh, kind of a NASA program for how to pick eight personalities that could get together in all functions for two years. And, of course, the mission ended up in murder and disaster of with course. the sole survivor being the illegitimate offspring of two of the scientists who were not supposed to have hooked up. So... Yes, this is an important thing, and if we can get away with this for a five hundred thousand dollar investment from uh, NASA, that's that's small change and worth a hell of a lot more than all the Muslim outreach they've been doing instead. Yeah, well said. I think actually for the Mars mission, they ought to put me and Torre from MSNBC on the crew. I think that would be an awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, just, you know, that'd be the like kind that. of that'd be the kind of cooperation that you'd, you'd kind of really want yeah. to expect out of this sort of thing. Well, Scotty, you know, the human body is an amazing thing here, and not just the human body, all mammals pretty much do some pretty interesting things when the temperatures get low. Traditionally on hibernation, you see these guys going into deep freeze and the, and the you know, the lid frosts over and everything, but obviously you get people too cold, they're going to die. If you get them below freezing, their cells will burst, and that's generally considered to be a bad <laughs> thing. Bad. However, if you drop the temperature down to about 70 degrees or so, your pulse rate drops to about four per minute, one breath or two per minute, and strangely enough, Scott, there's some evidence to indicate that if you add hydrogen sulfide, yes, that's that rotten egg smell, there's something about hydrogen sulfide that also slows down the metabolism and makes you basically last a lot longer and a lot less oxygen and air. So my question to you is, how would you feel about being cooped up in a something considerably smaller than a phone booth, uh, dipped into a you know, pretty much cold water bath at 70 degrees and had nothing but rotten egg smell pumped into your chamber? Does that make you kind of ready to go to Mars or does that uh, somewhat deter you a little bit? Well, that sounds very alluring, and you make it sound even more so every time you say the word rotten egg smell. Um, you know, it, actually, I have a personal connection to this whole, whole idea, too, because it was immediately after viewing the movie Forever Young, starring Mel Gibson, oh, yeah. that I went out to the parking lot and in the little uh, compact car held the hand of Stephanie, who was then Stephanie Neal, and asked her oh. to marry me. Oh. And I oh. don't know... 
if it was, uh, you know, part of the inspiration was the Spirit of God saying, this is the woman you're supposed to be with for the rest of your life, or it was the idea that, hey, somebody might, like, freeze me and I'll never get a chance to do this. <laughs> but I, I think uh, two things occur to me. Number one is, if we're going to travel to a distant planet or star system or something like that, I want everybody on the vessel out. Because it's always the guy who's awake who's the troublemaker. So That's everybody right. has to be out. And secondly, I want to, uh, to take this idea and transfer it into government. I think as soon as we <laughs> swear somebody in, as soon as the new is president going. is sworn in, as soon as the new Congress is sworn in, into the cryo chambers, set that timer on four years and leave it. Hillary can, can, can go wait, back wait. to the magnetic docking bay where she was uh, originally launched can, from. Go ahead, Steve. Can, yeah. can we do this retroactively? Because I would like to spend the last eight years in suspended <laughs> animation. That's right. Maybe it's us that we should, we should do it to us instead of the elected officials. I said many times before on the other show. You know what? Uh, during what did you think of Obama's inaugurations? It's like I I was out for both of them. I was in a medically induced coma. Uh, <laughs> I was in a vodka yeah, induced coma. But it, same there day. you go. Yeah. There you go. Well, folks, you know, it sounds like a trivial thing, but it's actually not. This is one of the big problems that you have to solve in terms of getting to distant planets. You have to worry about resources, and you also have to worry about crew sanity. You know, round trip to Mars right now is a two-year adventure. If we got back the nuclear rockets that work just fine in the NERVA program, it'd be a, more like a four- or five-week adventure. So this is not actually trivial stuff, and it's really kind of fun for me. Uh, everybody pretty much knows about my love of Star Trek. My studio here is pretty much the Museum of Star Trek, but... I've said this before, I'm not terribly proud of it. The original influence on me, of course, was Lost in Space. And seeing everybody get into those Mylar suits and step into those, those, those acrylic tubes and just suddenly go quiet and then just through space was really impressive. So it's actually doable and the research is really important, but here's the part I find kind of the most ironic and sad about all this. This is the kind of thing, this is exactly the kind of thing that NASA should be doing. Basic research into the idea of what we have to do to make space flight feasible. Uh, the, the tragedy is that they're spending $500,000 on this. That's half a million dollars of their $14,000 million annual budget. And NASA spends $14,000 million not to send people in space. And they spent $14,000 million back in 2006 when we were flying you know, four space shuttles. I've had many people in private space business tell me that if, if NASA, if the FAA had existed when aviation was in its golden age, we'd still be traveling from Los Angeles to New York in a twin engine, wood wing propeller airplane that carried 20 passengers at 6,000 feet and 120 miles an hour and the tickets would cost $17,000 each. That's what this regulatory industry has done. There is a place I think for NASA and the place for NASA is things like where NACA used to be. NACA, the National Air, National Aeronautics Council, something like that. Anyway, it was the predecessor of NASA, and I really used to know what that was. And they basically <laughs> developed all the airfoils that we use in wings today. You just find the NACA oh, wow. 1702 and you put it on the plane, boom. NASA should be doing the same kind of thing. Exploration missions like Mars probes and things like this are NASA's business. But running actual manned space program, I think, has been shown now for 20 years that this is not something that they or the government are particularly good at. For Steve Green, Scott Ott, and the rest of your Right Angle crew, I'm Astro Boy Bill Whittle <laughs> locking himself in the chamber and setting it on to infinity, and off we go. We'll see you next time. <laughs>